This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. This episode features garden designer, grower, speaker, and writer, Andrew Sankey. Andrew specialises in English cottage gardens and has meticulously researched the subject for decades, becoming an expert on this style of gardening. He's recently released a book called The English Cottage Garden, and in the interview, we talk about what defines a cottage garden, both in the past and now, the plants and features most commonly found in one, and tips if you're looking to create your own. I started by asking Andrew, what was a cottage garden historically, and what is it now? Ah, right. Um, historically, uh, a cottage garden was um, a peasant's plot or a peasant's garden. Um, uh, the, the peasants, the Saxons um, and the Normans had these little plots attached to cottages, which provided uh, extra food, which they required. They might have worked for the local lord as a labourer. They might have worked in the, the fields surrounding the village, but they, they needed to provide extra food in their own little plot to survive, basically. So it was a combination of uh, basic vegetables, basic herbs, and uh, a few animals to supplement their their um, uh, basic sufficiency. And also, of course, they all had large families, so they lots of children to feed and that. So it, it, what it basically gave them was what we call bread and pottage, which was the basic diet. And uh, into the pottage went any vegetables, any herbs, that you could grow and manage. So that's the old traditional cottage garden. The modern has totally moved away from that um, simply because uh, people go to the supermarkets and buy all their own food now. Uh, they don't necessarily grow it. Uh, they, they don't have animals as such. Uh, uh, I've, I have not yet come across a person, even in the cottage garden society, who keeps, still keeps pigs. Um, which was a staple diet. So we've moved away from a self-sufficient small plot holding, if you will, to uh, a more floriferous garden, but using more of the cottage herbs, more of the cottage flowers, uh, and a few of the old cottage trees to, to create uh, a, a sort of oasis in the cottage style. Uh, and the cottage garden used a lot of native plants, um, a lot of early introductions, uh, and those are the things that come through, particularly uh, roses, climbers, um, and uh, pretty spring flowers like primroses, foxgloves, those sort of native flowers. So those are still in the modern cottage garden, but we supplement it with lots and lots of other flowers. And the, the season is far longer. We have a, a greater flowering season than ever the cottage garden did have. Yeah, and the other thing that I was um, interested in terms of categorising a cottage garden is how big can a cottage garden be? Ah, now that is fascinating. Yeah, so the old cottage gardens were quite a size. Um, and uh, in the Elizabethan period, Queen Elizabeth I set down a, a basic standard for a, a peasant's labourer's garden, and that was two acres. Um, sounds enormous today, but of course you have to remember they were growing all their own herbs for all the different reasons, medicinal, uh, going into the pot, pot herbs, stewing on the floor, then they had a, a small, maybe a small orchard, and then they might have had a bean field or something at the end. So two acres sounds a lot. It wasn't today. You can do a cottage style on a tiny plot because you're taking out the the idea of not, never an inch of the garden was ever wasted. So you can use every part of the garden. Um, all cottage gardens uh, from the beginning didn't have lawns because it was a, a waste. So if you take out the lawn, you've got far more space for flowers. Uh, and herbs and uh, the odd trees or shrubs and they also used companion planting where they grew one thing through another so uh, on a small scale today it's the ideal uh, garden for a lot of people yeah it definitely is uh and thinking about the um the, again the elements that make up a cottage garden obviously you said they're quite floriferous now um are there any hard landscaping elements that categorize uh or characterize a cottage garden um yeah, that is difficult. They, they, the hard landscaping elements would have varied from region to region um, simply because they use the local materials. So if you go up to the Cotswolds, 
uh, which is very attractive, of course. Now look at Cotswolds cottages. Uh, you've got the, the stone cottages, um, and often, instead of a hedge, they've got a wall um, used for the Cotswold stone to, to define the, the size of the garden. Um, and you, you normally find the front of the garden has a, a quite a nice wall with a gate in it. Um, if you went to um, sort of Lincolnshire, you often found they had brick paths from the gate to the, the uh, sort of cottage door because there was a lot of brick making and they would have uh, got the bricks very, very cheaply or got seconds and used those. So the, it varies area to area. Um, most of the time, uh, the, the main paths were basically just soil, compacted soil with ash or later on clinker thrown on to create some sort of dry system. But the, the, the central path could be the local material. Um, and often they edged it, uh, certainly, in, again, in Lincolnshire, they edged it with bricks up on end to create that sort of up and down movement with bricks uh, pointed up all the way down the first path. So it, the, lo the materials would have been local. Even if up in Yorkshire, they used um, York stone, which is highly expensive today, but was uh, the, the cheap local material when cottagers used it. So you, a lot of the Yorkshire cottage gardens have got these huge, great slabs of York stone as their paths uh, running down to the cottage. So it was all local, all local. You just bought in from local. As you were speaking then about the, the different sort of heights of, path, of paths and edging, it made me think, actually, and this might be a really silly question, that I tend to think of a cottage garden as being very flat. Was that a feature of the garden or would it have been, would that have kind of naturally followed on from the sites that were chosen for these places or would they have been levelled or is that just a complete misnomer? So are some of them not not flat? No, it, it, some of them aren't flat. Um, uh, I've visited many, many cottage gardens uh, and again, it just depends on the part of the country uh, the cottager or labourer was living in. So if you're in uh, Lincolnshire, yes, they're flat. Um, if you go up into the Yorkshire Dales, they're not going to be. Um, and so what they tended to do then was terrace the gardens. Um, so you'd have uh, the, the outside near the back door on one level of maybe a yard, and then you might go up a level to the next section and so on. So uh, they just worked with what they were they were given within the village. Um, so if you've got hills all around, of course, your cottage is going to have to be on, on a slope. But um, the, the garden itself, they would level off and then have steps up from one level to the other. So they worked with what they were given or with, with what they'd got, basically. It sounds like they're more relevant than ever, um, you know, in terms of how we're trying to garden today because it, it, they're using local materials, they're growing vegetables for the family. You know, do they make a really good blueprint for how we probably should be gardening more in this day and age? I, I, I totally agree. Yes, they are. But I think they're the ideal blueprint. Um, I'd like to, I, I was thinking of writing an article on this, um, that the, the cottage garden is probably the garden that can be accommodated in all the new builds that, of houses that are going on because the gardens have shrunk, of course. They're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, uh, and I feel with a small garden, you might as well just dispense with the lawn. Um, you can have an area, obviously, for uh, like a patio for enjoying, but you could then move into uh, a more cottage garden beyond that uh, and utilise the space, ideally. Uh, and it works beautifully in any part of the country, of course. Um, so, yeah, it's an, I, if I was to give this a name, I, I, uh, I would call it cottage-esque. Um, in the form of a cottage garden, but with a, a modern twist, obviously, because we have a far greater range of plants than they ever did to to utilise and use. But yeah, it, it's a brilliant um, design um, for small gardens. And, and in fact, in uh, the book, I try to emphasise the fact that you could get things for small gardens and utilise small gardens more effectively. Yeah, so you just mentioned plants. Um... In terms of planting techniques, which stand out as most cottage garden? Like I know we have a much bigger range now, but is, are there particular things that characterise the planting in a cottage style garden? Yeah, there, oh, there are. Yes, um, the the cottagers particularly loved uh, spring flowers, um, and uh, we still do today. So um, a lot of people 
uh, think the spring is the best time of year because you've gone through the winter and then you've got nice bright flowers coming up. Uh, and it's a joy to see them, see what's coming up each day as the spring. So a lot of spring flowers were uh, loved by cottagers. Um, and a lot of the, the ones that uh, are part woodland but can still be grown in all gardens, um, like the, uh, the foxgloves and the honeysuckles um, and some of the roses, uh, they can be grown in small spaces um, and they can grow virtually anywhere. So the, those sort of plants are ideal for the, even for the modern gardens today. Um, and there's lots of those. As the garden went on into uh, late spring and into summer, of course, uh, the, the roses took over. Um, and then uh, by the time you got to late summer, uh, in the original cottage garden, most of the gardens were coming to an end. Uh, in the Elizabethan period, what's changed all that uh, in the, the, that sort of late period of Elizabeth I was new introductions coming from Europe, which then sort of started to extend the season for us. But uh, we can utilize the garden. I always say to people, um, plant when you, when you use the garden most. Uh, so if, you're, if you like the spring and you're going to be out there, put more spring plants in. If you're going to be enjoying it through the summer, do that. Uh, I always encourage people not to plant when they're, you know, if you take a holiday in July and August, don't have plants that actually flower in your work your your planting schemes and your ideas around when you'll most use the garden. And historically, would those cottage gardens have been essentially fairly empty and unproductive during the winter months? They, now they would have been fairly empty of flowering plants, but they wouldn't have been empty of uh, vegetables because a lot of the the vegetables, of course, run through the winter. So cabbages, uh, leeks. Brussels sprouts, um, uh, the late uh, uh, pumpkins and gauze, they all run through the late winter period. So although the, the flowers might be going over, they had lots of vegetables that could work with. They were also um, uh, had the, fruit, the late fruit on the fruit trees, uh, which they would, would gather and store. Um, and the, their, one of the early introductions of sort of early to medium introductions that cottagers loved were Michaelmas daisies. And the reason was they extended their season in the garden, gave them a lot of colour for a long period at the end. So there were just a, a few plants that they felt were wonderful for the end of the year. Um, hydrangeas and Michaelmas daisies being two of the favourite late cottage garden plants. And thinking about the trees, uh, again, I think probably a lot of people would think fruit trees in a cottage garden. Would it have been limited to fruit trees or, or thinking in terms of today, what might we replace fruit trees with or what would make a suitable tree for a, a cottage garden? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, most people assimilate, uh, 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 as you say, cottage garden with fruit trees. And of course, um, they were originally were very large. Uh, yeah, even uh, so, it was mainly apples and pears to begin with. Um, people often uh, tell ask me about the Victoria plum, uh, but the name says it all. It, ca it was introduced during the reign of Victoria, so it's quite a late entrant. But uh, you don't have to have fruit trees. Of course, we want a more uh, uh, good-looking garden, uh, and you can buy fruit, uh, and you can get fruit quite easily. So th a better thing to do would be go for a small tree, within the garden and there are uh, a number of small trees which would ideally suit the cottage garden style. Um, a rowan, which was um, a traditional uh, cottage garden tree, uh, particularly up in Scotland. Uh, the, the, if you go to Scotland and go around some of the small villages, you often still see two rowan trees um, standing either side of a cottage garden gate. Uh, and that ties into um, the fact that the trees were small, but they also kept evil and witches out of your garden. There's lots of superstition wrapped up into some of the early um, cottage garden plants. Uh, the holly was very, very popular. Uh, and again, that was more in England. Uh, you often find lots of cottages called holly cottage because they often had a holly tree or a holly bush or even a hedge around the cottage itself. Uh, but you can add to that other different ones today. Um, one of my favorites is uh, uh, the uh, amelanchias. Uh, they are a wonderful small tree for a cottage garden. Uh, they stay at about 20, 25 feet, which is actually small, um, have the most amazing flowers 
in the spring covering the whole of the tree. Uh, uh, you can then, if you wish, put a climber up to come up and flower through in the summertime, maybe a clematis. And then in the autumn, the leaves turn a gorgeous autumn colour as well. So you really get uh, two bites of the cherry, the flowers and the autumn colour. And then if you grow something up, it, you can have a flower during the summer as well. So something like that is uh, ideal. There are um, uh, other smaller trees that can be looked into as well, but that, those are really good for cottages. Yeah, it was interesting. You you make some planting recommendations in your book. And one of the things that really interested me was when you spoke about using plants as supports for other plants. And I wondered if you'd just mention, you've, obviously you've said about the clematis going up through the tree. I wondered if you could also mention another couple of examples of that, because I thought that was a really good use of space. Yeah, uh, any vertical space um, in gardens is highly useful for the climbers. So, um uh, in previous times, of course, they used to let the honeysuckles um, ramble up the front and over the top. Um, uh, ivy, I wouldn't recommend that, but uh, ivy of cottages, you get ivy cottages. But they, th their philosophy was growing one thing through another. Um, uh, this was uh, also emphasized by Gertrude Jekyll when she worked with uh, Luttins and their, her big scheme. She often had a large perennial or plant, and then she'd you'd put something else up through it. So uh, not always uh, uh, perennial climbers, sometimes annual climbers. Uh, sometimes you put uh, uh, peas up through, sweet peas or um, possibly an everlasting pea or um, uh, a sh another short climber which went through a large uh, um, thistle um, or up through some of the big perennials that uh, she put into gardens. You can actually grow a lot of things up over everywhere. One of the uh, things I keep telling people is to uh, use runner beans. The, um, the, the runner bean, when it first came into the country, uh, was known as the arbor bean because they grew it over arbors for its pretty, lovely flowers. Um, they didn't actually eat the, the runner beans for about, I think it was about 150 years before they got to, to taste the beans themselves. And they grew it because it went up and over an arbor or over an arch. Um, and gave a, a nice shaded area, but had these lovely, pretty flowers. And I often say, you, you, you know, you, if you've got a piece of trellis or you've got a, a tripod, there's no reason why you can't use the runner beans in the garden um, as a, both a pretty flower and a vegetable at the same time. Uh, and that really is uh, sort of taking cottage garden, companion planting, putting two plants together for the benefit of one another, uh, growing one up through the other. So you can you can use that or possibly even uh, some squashes or gourds. Uh, they don't have to grow on the ground. People assume they grow on the ground, but you can actually train them up. So if you've got a pergola or arch in your garden, you could grow squashes or gourds up through and over the arch, and then the, the lovely fruits hang down the, uh, the arbor, the trellis, um, or the arch. Uh, keeps them off the ground, uh, keeps them dry, and they look good as well. Yeah, it's good. It's really good ideas that you've got in the book. Um, and given the lack of space in, in many modern gardens, um, would you advocate for growing edibles in them? And if so, you, obviously you've mentioned the the beans can grow up things and be space that there's space saving or ideas around that. Uh, is there anything else that you think is worth growing? Given as well the fact that you said you know obviously you can go to the supermarket and buy your fruit, you don't need to be growing that. Yeah, uh, there are. Uh, it, it depends on your. Um your taste, of course, but uh, uh, even in limited space, uh, you can grow a, a lot of vegetables um, that will take up very little and can be interplanted amongst other things. Um, I, there's nothing better, although you can go and get buy things, there's nothing better than picking it fresh. Um, so the, there's no reason why you, you couldn't put things into the border. One of the first things I ever did when I got into cottage gardening was to put um, rhubarb into my borders. Um, and we had the rhubarb through in the early part of the year, obviously for the, the crumbles and other things. And then I, I left the large leaves uh, as a foil um, for other plants that surrounded it. Um, and uh, with things like ruby chard as well, um, that because of the bright colors you can get, you can actually plant them and use them in the borders. 
and use them as focal points, but at the same time, crop from them and, and take them into the kitchen. Uh, and there's lots of other examples where you can grow certain vegetables um, within the, the actual garden. And they, they go in nicely. A lot of them have lovely foliage, uh, which is worth uh, uh, eating and using at the same time. Yeah, they definitely do. There's some really pretty uh, cultivars out there. Um, thinking about ornamental flowering plants, I'm sure, again, everybody can conjure up their typical cottage garden flowers. Um, what three would you not be without if you were designing? <laughs> that's a very, very, that's the worst question yet. That's a very, that's a very difficult one, right? Uh, cottage flowers I wouldn't be without. Um I would have to say uh, early on in the the beginning of the year, uh, for me, it would be uh, primroses. The, the primrose is um, obviously a, a native flower of the woodlands, but you can grow it uh, in a little bit of shade anywhere. And it, it's such an early, uh, lovely flower that brings in spring with it. Um, it, it primrose comes from the, the Latin prima rosa, meaning um, first rose of the season. Uh, and it, it's just a wonderful first thing that brightens up your year as you go ahead. So that would be, I think, one of my first. Um, uh, epi epimediums are another one which I really love. Uh, they're not as well known, um, uh, but a lot of uh, sort of cottages are growing them now. They're a really good ground cover, and they have two bonuses. Again, early spring flowers, but a lovely foliage, which is heart-shaped, um, and it covers the they cover the ground at about a, a foot high, and then the the colour of the leaves turns uh, gorgeous colours uh, within the sort of uh, mid to late autumn. Um, so you've got a bonus, and then when the leaves dry, uh, they turn a, a bronzy colour, like a beech hedge, and you can leave them on all the way through to February the following year before cutting them down. Um, and by the time you've cut them down in early February, within a few weeks, the flowers are emerging again. So it's an all year round um, sort of flower and perennial. Um, and possibly the, the other favourite cottage flower for me is, is the foxglove. Um, uh, there's a huge range now you can grow. Um, uh, I particularly like the white uh, as opposed to the, the purple because it lights up. It gives more light. Um, and I always, if I'm going to put foxgloves, have a drift of them. So you get this wonderful drift uh, of lovely white flowers. And of course, they're brilliant for bees as well. So they, they do a number of different jobs, um, but they will probably be my, my top three. And talking of bees, um, should cottage gardens be good for wildlife, do you think? Yeah, if you have a cottage garden, um, the garden is immediately beneficial to all wildlife and the reason is you've got this great mix of plants um, and that's what the insects like um, and not only that a lot of the cottage flowers have these open flowers uh, that bees and other insects can get into and get the um, pollen and nectar from uh, a lot of the modern varieties and the double varieties don't have that they're, they're no good for bees and insects but a lot of the old cottage flowers are far far superior um, and if you mix up uh, ground cover and uh, perennials and cottage flowers and the odd tree and shrub you've got the ideal situation for bringing wildlife birds bees butterflies all into the garden they're, they're brilliant for that and given that they are perhaps more modest in size the the typical cottage garden um where might people go and see good examples of them that are open to the public Ah, uh, yes, yeah, that's uh, well. The, uh, my first choice would be to um, go to National Garden Schemes Gardens. Uh, you would have to get a copy of the yellow book or the the uh, the leaflet for your particular county, um, and look through it. And there will always be a number of good individual cottage gardens that ordinary people have created, and that is a good start. Um, often, uh, they also have a few plants for sale, so that's a, an excellent way to go. Um, the the other really good cottage garden that, that's got me going, got me started, um, is Marjorie Fish's Cottage Garden, uh, which is East Lambrook Manor down in Somerset. Uh, and her garden is, is still there as a great example of a cottage garden, um, a little bit bigger than most, but it's split up into smaller areas. 
um, and there's a really lovely nursery uh, attached to it as well. So that's where I'd start. Yeah. Perfect. And if people wanted to find out more about your work, where would they find you? Um, basically, uh, if they wanted to find out more about my work, uh, they would uh, they would have to uh, uh, probably email me, or um, if they got, if they went and googled my name. I'm sure they'd find uh, I do lots of talks and courses across the country and uh, they could probably find somewhere where I'm going to lecture or talk on uh, one another of the subjects, you know, related to cottage gardens. Um, I'm also a member of the Cottage Garden Society, um, and uh, which is a fantastic society um, and can be connected, uh, you know, get connected through that as well. Thank you, Andrew, for taking part in the interview. The cottage garden style doesn't seem as if it will ever go out of fashion. It's versatile and doesn't need to surround a cottage in order to work. As Andrew mentioned, it's a great choice for a modern garden because it provides a variety of habitats and features many wildlife-friendly plants. It's relatively low impact to create and it can include edibles, so we can reduce the carbon footprint of our food. If you're interested in hearing from someone who's created a fantastic example of a cottage garden that's rich in biodiversity, Take a look at Val Bourne's book, The Living Jigsaw, and you can listen to an interview I did with Val back in episode 62. I've included a link to the episode in the notes. So long live the cottage garden, I say. Now, Andrew didn't include ivy in his list of climbing plants, but I would as it's one of my favourite garden plants for so many reasons. And Dr Ian Bedford is here now to tell us why we should include this plant for a particular winter bug. Throughout the year, Hedera helix, the common ivy, which is our only native evergreen vine, plays an important role within the environment, providing shelter and a stable habitat for numerous different species of Britain's wildlife. But then throughout autumn, the ivy blooms and becomes one of the most significant food sources for many end of season pollinators that are busy preparing themselves for the winter ahead. Attracted to the plant's yellowy green floral clusters, By their pungent perfume, the generalist feeding wasps, bees, flies, beetles and even late season butterflies will often transform the normally serene appearance of an ivy into a frenzied hive of activity as the insects compete for the flower's freshly produced nectar. And in the midst of this melee, particularly within southern England, it's becoming increasingly more common for us to find a colourful non-native bee called the ivy mining bee. First recorded in 2001, these invasive solitary bees with their orange and black striped bodies and fluffy ginger thorax hatch from their pupae within underground chambers to coincide with the ivy's flowering period. The males always emerge first and wait for the females. Then, As they appear, the males frantically compete with each other to mate, often becoming entangled together in a chaotic mass around the female on the ground. Eventually, a male will succeed before the female leaves for the ivy flowers. She'll then feed for a while on the nectar, restoring her energy before searching to find a slope of bare earth or sand where she can excavate a tunnel, usually alongside many other females that will be doing the same. When completed, she'll return to the ivy to collect pollen that she takes back to her tunnel, leaving it inside with a newly laid egg. She'll then repeat this over a few weeks until the tunnel is full of little chambers, each containing ivy pollen and an egg. The bees will then die before winter, leaving their eggs to hatch into tiny grubs that feed on the pollen and develop alone into the next generation of ivy mining bees that will once again emerge the following autumn, just in time for the ivy flowers. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast. 